Um, yes, Loneliness Awareness Week, that is why we are here today. And um, this is a week that was set up by a charity local to Bristol called the Marmalade Trust as a way of talking more about loneliness and um, reducing the stigma associated with loneliness. You know, loneliness is an emotion that everybody will feel at some point in their lives. Um, and sometimes we feel more lonely than others. And I know that, um, well, research shows that one of those times is becoming a new parent. And yesterday we talked a lot about identity and, and how loneliness can fit in with that sort of real transition period. Today we're going to explore loneliness in the, the feeding journey, um, both for mums but also for partners, because actually, um, certainly for those of you who are part of our classes, you know that we really do encourage feeding as a team. Um, but dads or partners can't always do the actual feeding part so um, they can potentially have feelings of loneliness within this time as well so we will be exploring for all of that today um, we are also going to look at what support networks are available to you and how these have changed in light of the pandemic because obviously things are not as they usually are right now um, and I think it's a really tricky time for new parents to be having um, their first babies and coping with the pandemic and the social distancing rules that we're all living under at the moment so we're going to explore that and how things have changed a little bit um, and you know how, how you can still find the support networks out there how you can still build those friendships um, and and you know, hopefully reduce those feelings of loneliness as well. So let me introduce our panel today. Um, first of all, we have Kate Battersby, who is a uh, top, well, she's next to me on my left, I think. Um, <laughs> Kate is a midwife and um, lactation consultant. She works up at um, Southmead um, and also has a private lactation um, pra consultancy practice supporting uh, new mums and, and, and parents um, through those early days getting breastfeeding established. Um, Michelle Weeks is our other expert on today. Hi Michelle, thank you. Um, Michelle is a birth and postnatal doula um, and yeah, she supports um, new parents building their confidence in those early weeks and months with, with a baby in the house. Michelle, maybe you can just explain a little bit about what a doula does, um, both birth and the postnatal elements, so that people can understand that a bit better. Yeah, of course. Um, so as a birth doula, um, I will support you from, well, as soon as you contact me, whether that's the day you do your pregnancy test or sometimes a week before you're due um, and I we will get to know each other we'll build up a relationship I will come to your home and we'll sort of we'll discuss things that matter to you things that are important to you the big the small all the questions you think are silly and I always say there are no silly questions um, discuss those things that maybe you didn't get quite enough time to talk with your midwife through um, or if you've been to antenatal classes, things that came up that you think, oh, how does that affect me? You know, that's something that I think is really important. Um, questions that your partner might have. Um, we even go around your home and think about how we can, how you can sort of rearrange things to make your nest and um, to make things comfortable, feeding corner and things like that. Um, and then I go on call for you um, two weeks before your due date. Um, that's 24-7. So if you call me at three in the morning, I'm there picking up the phone um, and I'll come and meet you wherever you're um, in labour, whether that's at your home or a birthing centre or a hospital. Um, and I will stay with you throughout your labour. Um, I don't do shifts. Um, so whether that's three hours, three days, I'll be there um, sleeping in the corner if I need to. Um, and yeah, and I'll stay, I'll stay with you until, until you feel settled once your baby's arrived. Um, probably after a first feed um, and then I'll go home and then I will come and meet you postnatally um, usually about in the first week at some point mm. um, and we'll debrief your birth if you've got any questions about it anything that came up um, things that you don't remember that obviously I've got a different perspective of how things went um, and you can ask me questions about anything that happened um, and then as a postnatal doula 
Um, it depends. There's no set structure really. Some people, I, some families I will visit once a week for four or five hours, some for a couple of hours every day. Um, usually for about six to eight weeks. Um, there's first few weeks or sometimes after your partner's gone back to work. That's usually a time when people feel they need a little bit of extra support. Um, and I will help you with whatever you need help with. So whether that's some light chores around the house, um, whether that's um, signposting you to amazing breastfeeding counsellors, mm -hmm. um, or if you want to just sit and talk. Sometimes, you know, in this topic of loneliness, sometimes I do just go, and in fact, most of the time we sit and drink tea and talk. Sometimes about EastEnders, sometimes about your baby, whatever you want to talk about really. Um, if you've got questions, I'll try and answer them. Um, and yeah, sometimes I'll support people going out on their first walk um, or appointments they might have just to build up that confidence really. Um, if, they, if, if you've got toddlers or older children, I can help sort of um, help them work through any issues, you know, having a new baby around, new sibling, um, or even look after your baby for a while while you sleep or have a shower, or play with your toddler. Just have those, you know, half an hour or something just to yourself, um, or with your partner, in fact, you know, have that time together. Um, it really, there's no one size fits all, really. It just depends what you need as a family. Um, Great, yeah. thanks, Michelle. Cool, so, <clears throat> yeah, so we um, are going to start our discussion now, and we'll start exploring loneliness a bit more generally. I appreciate that some of you were on our call yesterday, but I think it is an, it's an important question. Um, Michelle, again, if we start with you, what are some of the reasons that you think new parents feel lonely, especially in those, maybe those first three months with a newborn in the house? What, what do you think are the key, key trigger points within that? Yeah, I think, um, I think there's lots of things, practical and emotional. Um, I think on a practical level, um, finances, um, you know, people have gone on maternity leave, obviously, you know, if they've left, uh, left a job, um, maternity pay is not always that great. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're in lockdown, obviously, you know, work is, you know, some people have been furloughed, some people haven't, um, that's all quite different. Um, and I think, so if I think financially, um, people then, um, spend, you know, you know, there are things your baby will need, you know, your baby will need clothes, um, you know, and there's a lot of things that people think they also need, <laughs> lots of gadgets and gizmos and, and things. Um, and I think the idea of spending time and money on themselves, um, going out for a coffee, um, even, feels really selfish. I think people don't value actually the value of that coffee where there might be other parents that you might meet um has far more value than a fancy buggy um yeah <laughs> or, or joining a yoga class or you know or something that you will benefit from i think people are really reluctant to do that when they know they've got a baby coming and they just everything's about that baby suddenly um and i think it's invaluable the long-term benefits of spending just that bit of money on yourself, um, the long-term benefits, I think, will really counteract that loneliness um, in the initial stages. Um, I think on a practical, on an emotional level, I think also um, people really miss um, the true adult um, engagement. You know, if you're stuck at home with a baby for those first three months, they are gorgeous. They are your life. You know, you can stare at them for hours on end and they are beautiful, you know, and you can just stare at them and watch all those noises and things. And it's amazing. Um, I can do that with anyone's baby. <laughs> um, but it's those conversations of, like I said, talking about EastEnders or what Boris Johnson's up to next or <laughs> you know, what takeaway to get at the end of the week or something, you know, it's just those where you just feel human and, and, and like an adult and that you matter, that you're important. Um, I think that's when you can feel lonely because suddenly everybody, 
is looking at your baby. So what, what's your baby's name? How much do they weigh? You know, and it, very often people don't ask, how are you? How, how, you know, how are you doing? Well, they might say it, but it's a flippant, you know, how are you? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. Yeah. You know, whereas I always stop and say, no, no, how are you? You yeah. know, how are you feeling? And, you know, how did you sleep? How, you know, rather than just, yeah, I'm fine. Because no new mother is fine. <laughs> That's not really an adjective to use when you're a new mother. Um, and I think, you know, it's that sense of, and I guess you probably you might have covered this yesterday in terms of identity, um, that you're then, you're just a mum um, and you're not the person that you were, but you still matter and you're still here. Um, and that can make you feel quite lonely. I think, you know, that even when you're full of, in a room full of family and friends and, or at a play group with lots of other people, but all they're asking about is your baby. Um, I think that's where you can feel at a loss really. Um, right. Thank you. And um, Kate, would you add anything into that? Oh, I mean, like, thanks, Michelle, because I completely 100% agree with all that you've said that, you know, when you become a new mum, your whole identity changes, doesn't it? And you've got this little person that is taking up a huge, huge amount of your time, uh, particularly around the feeding side of things. You know, they're, they're very, very small and they need to grow big. You know, they, they, so they double their birth weight by around four months. So of course a huge amount of time is going to be spent feeding your baby which can lead to a, an enormous amount of loneliness and isolation um so yeah it is a it is a, a really tricky tricky time and particularly through covid a pandemic um where your normal support network is totally blown apart and uh, i was just saying to iona that mums that i'm seeing at the moment the antenatal classes that they have all the groups that they had joined they haven't ever met their sort of fellow mums to be or new mums which uh, is very hard isn't it to build a relationship with somebody really that you you have never really properly sort of met in person um so yeah it is a it is a, a tricky tricky time um but I think it, it is all about being open, isn't it, with each other, that although you haven't met each other in person, that can almost level the relationship amongst your, your groups, your, your groups that you've, you've joined initially, to find that support that um, everybody is in exactly the same boat. You're not having that same family support that you would have had, you know, mum coming in and staying or um, friends popping in. Uh, when when they would normally have maybe have been you know a really big source of support for you so actually having um you guys on the end of your whatsapp groups can feel hugely useful for you at the moment um because like i say you are all in the same boat and it's really important to be so honest with each other like michelle said there is no fine when you are a new mum everybody will have challenges and I'll see one mum and they'll say, everybody in my group, they're getting on so well. There's no problem, they're not having any problems at all. And I'll have just been to see three of the other mums in the group and they'll all have been saying exactly the same. They're not getting on well at all or they've got their own challenges or their own issues with feeding and being a new mum and their baby's behaviour. So yeah, it is so important to be honest with each other. So on that, Kate, how, you know, if, if all of these new mums are all feeling the same emotions and struggling, maybe in different ways struggling, but struggling, but then feeling unable to be open about that, why do you, why do you think that is? Because I think we see well, a lot of that now. Yes, so, I, yeah, I, say, I, I, th I think we see a lot of that now. So, yeah. I think, first off, we have our own preconceptions, don't we, of how, how being a mum is and how, how it's all going to be perfect. Yeah. Uh, we see the OK Hello magazines of the new mums with the, you know, holding their babies looking absolutely perfect and their figures all back to normal. Um, we see yeah, the, all that is social media and all that that has to offer and how you know, this is the normal. Mm. It's, not, it's not normal. This is, that is not, not normal. Um, so um, it is that, that um, realisation when 
um, you know, you're sort of a week into being a new mum and you're thinking, gosh, I haven't even brushed my teeth today um, and it's uh, seven o'clock in the evening or uh, you haven't really got up off the sofa other than just to have a wee um, and then get back to, you know, baby again. Uh, that is the reality uh, that babies do feed a lot um, and, it, and it is really, really normal. But it's sort of almost not it's it's accepting that um but also surrounding yourself with people and reaching out for that support um i mean we are in the summer months so there are, are you know the, the perfect place to be the meet is obviously the meetups in parks and um if you know people you know a bit better meeting up in their gardens um, we can absolutely do that social distancing and actually I live just close to the downs and it's so lovely now to see the groups of new mums sitting around feeding their babies that's becoming our new norm now um, whereas before they would be meeting in cafes and cafes actually they they have their own cause their own anxieties you know will my baby cry when I'm in a cafe and upset the person next to the table in the next door table who hasn't got a baby who's come for peace and quiet what if my baby wakes up and needs a feed and I can't latch the baby quickly um so actually being outside that that actually can reduce a lot of stress and you know what it's like to be out in the fresh air and appreciate a sunny day can really be uplifting and be sort of good for the good for the sort of soul and good for the heart uh, refresh the the sort of mindset a little bit as well yeah no I think that's a really interesting one actually um and possibly you know one of the benefits of zoom as well that I know for mums who maybe are just having one of those days and unable to get up off the sofa because of a feeding you know about a cluster feeding or haven't managed to get up and dressed and out then possibly jumping onto a zoom call for half an hour or an hour or you know even a couple of hours but having that option to switch your video off if the baby's just having a bit of a tricky time and then come back you know maybe it does offer some more social time as well potentially that's right and there's no perfect time to talk with somebody else you know and that's that's the beauty of of being able to virtually access um the support that we were just saying that you know when when you've got that you're looking at a mum who's breastfeeding you know you can sort of see this much of them because they're they're obviously feeding i can see alison uh, i think are you feeding your baby alison maybe yeah so we can see nothing so it's it's maybe not waiting for that perfect moment to reach out for help in the day when the baby's going to be settled and quiet because probably that won't happen realistically so it is like you said Iona having the option of muting your, your, your video call so that you can just go ahead and feed your baby um, but it's just having that support out there is just so so important mm. yeah and maybe if we can just explore the topic of loneliness in in the feeding journey and what it looks like for both partners involved you know because i mean it could be that um we have single mums who are breastfeeding and that that will be a very different journey potentially to um a mum who has a partner um and <laughs> <laughs> call coming through somewhere uh, <laughs> that's all right <laughs> um or whether you know the mum uh, you know you've got a mum with a partner um the mum's journey breastfeeding is going to have its own elements of loneliness whereas the partner's is going to have potentially a different set of elements um yeah i don't know who wants to start us off on some of the things i've talked a lot michelle you 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 go on in okay um yeah so i think in terms of partners, um, it can feel, you know, like they sun suddenly maybe become the skivvy or oh, fetch me the water, fetch me my food or oh, my book or I can't reach the remote control. Um, and that is helpful. You know, it can be helpful for them to do those things for you. Mm. Um, and it kind of gives them something to do, but it can feel um, a bit monotonous, a bit onus on them. Um, so I think sometimes... Um, finding their thing with their baby so whether it's them that has a bath with the baby and that's their role um 
So they, so you have your thing and they have their thing. But um, something, an exercise I do with clients, um, sort of antenatally, we discuss postnatal a lot. And an exercise that we actually do is we write down a list of um, things that individually are really important to you for your well-being um, and mental health. The big and the small things. So whether it's um, having a cup of tea with a biscuit, um, whether it's um, going for a bike ride, doing a yoga session, um, reading a book for half an hour, uh, make, uh, baking cake or putting on makeup and blow drying your hair, whatever makes you feel good and is important and you know something that you don't want to lose. Um, I make them each write a list of things that are really important to them. Um, and then I also make them write a list of things that are important to them as a couple, things that they've always done that they always enjoy, whether it's uh, reading the newspaper in bed on a Sunday, um, watching a certain box set, planning a holiday, um, going for coffee in their favorite coffee shop or something, whatever it is. Um, and then breaking those down into things they can do in five minutes, 15 minutes, half an hour, um, an hour. So that when they get those snippets of time where they think suddenly, you know, maybe they feel lonely um, or hooray, I've got a moment of time. Um, they can, they have things to do. They have a list of things that they can think of. They don't have to think, what am I going to do? What can I do to entertain myself? I'm feeling lonely. She's busy feeding. What can I do? They have things to hand you know, and, and, and also how long they can take, you know, um, and it's, and it just means that they don't have to think about it in their sleep deprived state, mm -hmm. uh, you know, oh, I've got half an hour while she feeds, what should I do, you know, and because sometimes you can feel like you've wasted the time, even though sometimes sitting doing nothing isn't wasting your time at all. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, to do those things that really boost your well-being and your mental health, I think for partners particularly is really important as well to remember that and to yeah. not uh, lose sight of those things. I think it's really important. Yeah, no, I like that. I like that exercise, actually. Yeah, I really like that. That's excellent. It yeah. is so hard for partners, isn't it? Because they, yeah. they sort of, they lose their partner almost, don't they? During, particularly during yeah. that early postnatal period when you have got a new baby and, mm. and there is so much time taken up with, you know, the baby feeding or doing whatever. Mm. And that can also cause, uh, you know, quite a bit of conflict, particularly... Yeah. When mums breastfeed, they have very, very high levels of oxytocin, which allows them to manage very, very effectively without much sleep at all. But what dads don't have is that high levels of oxytocin. So dad can be getting a huge amount more sleep than mum, and they'll be walking around the house, oh, so tired. <laughs> and the mum's like, what? <laughs> more than me but they can't help it they they literally can't help it that is you know how you know super mums are made mm -hmm. and dads just don't have that uh, that that level of oxytocin to allow them to cope with that you know with, to allow them to cope with the lack of sleep yeah um, but I'd agree with you that it is important that sort of dads find their groove as well with the baby like you were saying Michelle whether that's bathing with the baby which can be done very very early on in that you know that new baby's life but mum passing the baby into the bath with dad already in there and it's a really lovely close time that dads can enjoy together maybe they're cheap they're being cheap chief nappy changer you know brilliant wonderful as you say you know head cook and bottle washer certainly definitely um but also they, they can, you know, once the feeding is established, so once you're feeling confident with the latch or um, you're confident with your supply, once the baby reaches about sort of three weeks, the mum could definitely start to express some milk and the dad could maybe just feed the baby a bottle, if that's what the mum would like or if that's what the two of them would like. Um, just maybe, you know, once a day or twice a week, whatever works for them and their family. And that's a really special time for the dad then to have. Um, and a, a lovely feed for the dad to do is sort of that 5 a.m. feed. Um, so that if mum has had a, a busy night, they know that the cavalry are going to arrive uh, in the form of dad, not quite on his black stallion, but anyway, close to. Um, and 
take the baby and um, then do that very sort of early morning feed, allow the mum then to have that bit of a stretch of sleep first time, first part of the morning. Um, yeah, we see quite a lot of that tag teaming actually. Um, and I think um, it comes back to recognizing what your roles are talking about it probably actually in pregnancy so because I think there are there are the, there are a lot of feelings for partners potentially being left out or feeling jealous of the time with the baby or jealous that the baby wants mum because mum can satisfy their needs for food and comfort and all of these things and they can't do those things so they feel like that spare wheel in a relationship where up until that moment, they were the most important person, you know, in, in their partner's relationship. And suddenly they're playing second fiddle to a baby whose needs are all encompassing. Um, so, yeah, I think having some of those conversations, exploring what those early months look like, because they what they start like in those first couple of weeks won't be how they are three months later. Um, and, you know, I think maybe taking it a step at a time and recognizing where those changes can come in, um, but also trying to keep some of those lines of communication open. Um, so Kate, do you ever work at all with people on uh, sort of, cause I know that you're also a big advocate for getting partners involved in feeding, whether that is watching how babies latch so that they can help with all of that um, side of things at a practical level in the very early days. But also, as you say, in those feeds later on, um, do you have any, um, I don't know, sort of communication tools or exercises or, or tips that you give new parents around this topic? Because I think it is such a, an emotional topic and there's so much packed yeah. into feeding. That's right. But very, very often when I will arrive at a consultation, that the dad will sort of feel that, that that this is their time that they can you know pop out and maybe go and do a shop or or um, tidy the house or do the washing up or do whatever. But actually, it's so important that the partner is there to hear the what you, the, the all that is around feeding and what it's like to have a new baby and um, the um, realization really of it. Um, so. It's so, so useful if any conversation around feeding, it, the, the dad is there to hear it too, um, because the expectation of, of maybe what it is can be so, so completely different to the reality of what it is. Mm. Um, it's also enjoying that, that togetherness as well. Mm. Um, so it, it, it's almost, you know, when you have a new baby, like Michelle said, it, it is lovely, you know, to, to have that wonderful feel of a baby and, and, and that closeness to a bit, to your baby. But sometimes you can feel all a bit sort of touched out a bit, you know, mm. just, want, just want some time to myself. So it is all sort of being open about that with your partner as well, that, you know, if I'm not feeling terrifically cuddly and huggy, it, it's not about you. It's not because I don't love you. It, it is just, um, I just need maybe a little bit of time to myself. Or likewise, just saying, I really am desperate for a hug rather than having, you know, to give out the hugs that you've been giving to your baby. Um, Actually, that is a really interesting point, isn't it? Because mums give so much of themselves, but they're giving themselves to something that's not communicating in the same way that maybe they need at this time and and um as you were saying earlier michelle you know visitors turn up they're interested in the baby and sort of kind of interested in the mum but mainly interested in the baby and so that on top of potentially this feeling that fe that feeding is the mum's domain so we'll just leave her to that actually there's so many opportunities to feel lonely in that journey from the responsibility from from all of those elements and yeah maybe you do want touch but you want adult touch in a different way and I think yesterday we talked a little bit about it actually in terms of whether that looks like a massage or a hug you know a proper hug um, from an adult <laughs> as opposed to just being for want of a better word used by your baby for for their needs um, 
Yeah. So, Michelle, maybe do you do anything with new parents around that side of their relationship, like bringing them together as a team so they can meet each other's needs as well, you know, separately to their babies, I guess? Yeah. Yeah. So we do, we post, uh, sort of antenatally, we always talk about the baby almost as like the third wheel in their relationship. Mm. So the baby is, is coming into their relationship and it's really important. It's partly why we do that exercise um, to sort of, realize how they can how can they maintain that relationship that they've had when someone else is is coming into it you know how can they maintain that and you know sort of as well as maintain their identity individually maintain it as a couple you know um so whether it's yeah you know we sort of talk about you know that exercise we say you know do you like do, is, is going out for dinner something you enjoy can you get a takeaway from your favorite restaurant Mm. especially now all sorts of places are doing takeaways aren't they yeah um, and can you set up a nice table at home and yeah if babies you know when you feel comfortable with feeding and things um you know baby might be feeding but your dinner and your meal together that's what's happening the baby might be feeding as well but you know and it's about finding those things together that um that matter you know that are important to you if it's a walk around the park on a sunday go for that walk, stick the baby in the sling, you know, or in the buggy. And that's, you know, the baby's coming along. It's your third wheel, but it's your time together. Um, I think it's just important to, to find those things together that matter to you, um, yeah. that keep your relation, that, you know, have always been in your relationship and maintain them. You know, they might change slightly and yes, you tag along your baby, um, mm -hmm. But, you know, see your baby in a slightly different role in those situations, you know. Your baby, of course, matters and you have to tend to their needs every now and again. And they might interrupt proceedings of whatever you're doing. But essentially that time is your time together. And that is the focus of that moment. Yeah. And Kate, um, going back to something you said earlier as well about often when you go around to support somebody for, um, you know, through the lactation consultancy thing, and that will be a time when dads pop out because they see it as that's the mum's domain. How much of that attitude do you think is changing? Because obviously I think it used to be very much, you know, that was mums and dads didn't get involved. But I think certainly for us, our, the dads who come to our classes or the partners because we have same sex couples as well you know they're desperate to be involved and they are and you can see like how involved they are when the babies arrive and things and it's lovely to see and we're you know we always talk about feeding as a team and how they can be involved in that as well so I think I see a very skewed um, view of it or, or is that more common these days I think it's massively more common common than it was. I, I'm obviously, you know, older, and um, my 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 dad. We I have I was one of four children, and my mum birthed her babies absolutely 100% on her own. Uh, she, my dad, proudly told me he never changed any of our nappies, and uh, he didn't even push. We are we are from Ireland, so you know, could be <laughs> a bit bad for her. Um, and didn't even push our push our pram. So, whereas now, and even you know, I see that in the hospital as well. You know, it is our baby, mm -hmm. and the dad is very very keen to be involved. But again, that can cause a little bit of conflict in the relationship. So, where the plan has been to breastfeed, and this is something that we really want to do. And then when feeding is, is beginning to be established, then the poor mum's nipples are so sore and they're so tired. And this is just a part, you know, I'm doing this the whole thing the whole time. And dad's like, oh, but we really want to do it. And actually, you know, the mum's thinking, actually, I'm not so keen anymore, to be honest. So that can cause real conflict among, amongst the couple. So uh, That is a really interesting point. Um, I know when we we were discussing doing these workshops one of our mums came back and said that there was an element of loneliness in being a mum because the buck stops with you and you're like no matter how much you co-parent and and how involved your partner is there's something about um 
being a mum that somehow we're meant to be born knowing what we're meant to do you know that's innate in us apparently as women but um but that there is that responsibility um, and there's that expectation of what motherhood looks like potentially. How much, you know, maybe how much does loneliness play into that role of mum? Of that yeah. responsible, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, hugely because we're, we're thinking that, you know, I, I should know what my baby wants. I should know, you know, and like you say, everything, you know, this, this all consuming being and, and, and we're supposed to know exactly, you know, what, what we're doing. And that's why it's so incredibly important. Like I said, from the start is to be honest amongst your group because we don't know, we, we you know, we, we really don't know. I mean, certainly my children are grown and, you know, I've blagged it really all the way. I, I have, you know, you just sort of, you, you get, you think you get to grips with one stage in their lives and then suddenly something else happens and then you sort of, you know, try, I'm sure you'll say the same, Michelle. So it's just to acknowledge that, that there is no perfect way to parent. There is no perfect mum that exists in the world. Your love will carry you through this time. And it's just being kind to yourself, all of you, that this is really, really tough and tough, particularly through this time. So try and, like I say, be kind to yourself, surround yourself with useful people mm. people that won't judge you, that um, you can feel you can be open and honest with. You know, I had a really rubbish night last night. I, I, was, I was really frustrated things like that just just being able to open up and um, be honest with the group about how you're feeling um, and like I say just reaching out for that help that will be useful the internet yes it can be useful but also it can be a really tricky place to navigate yourself around particularly around breastfeeding there's a huge mm -hmm. number of myths out there what mm -hmm. you're wanting are, are sites that are very reliable sites that have evidenced articles so that you know that you know when you're given advice by say a friend or what what you should do is well is actually that that is that really what 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 is right mm -hmm. um and also mostly there is no one size that fits all. Your baby is an individual with its own individual appetite. So it is following your baby's lead, um, trying to enhance your oxytocin. So enjoying those lovely skin to skin snuggles. Uh, like Iona was saying, maybe allowing your partner to give you a sort of a back massage. We know that that actively releases oxytocin. Mm reducing your stress in any way that you can um oxytocin is a is a wonderful natural mood enhancer so you know, we want to we want to get a load of that we have it anyway as breastfeeding mums so we want to really keep that flowing so keep the old cortisol that nasty stress hormone down as much as possible mm, yeah absolutely and um i'm going to come back to that point in a moment but Going back to the point about other people's opinions um, or judgments or, um, you know, helpful comments, which aren't always necessarily helpful. Can we explore this topic a little bit? Because I think that this is something I think possibly in pregnancy, you start to get a little bit of an understanding because somebody will come up to you and say something, you know, to you or they they feel that they have a right to touch you because you're pregnant and you've got a bump so you might start to recognize some of those th that those boundaries coming down but what you know there's 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 a there are a lot of opinions and judgments and comments whether you're breastfeeding bottle feeding um and they can leave new mums feeling a whole range of emotions but i think I think it can be really, really tough navigating that. How, what advice do you have for new parents on that? Firstly, Kate, and then we'll come to you as well, Michelle. Yeah, it is really hard, isn't it? I'm sure you've found that already, that everybody seems to have an opinion mm. on babies, don't they? And the advice just seems to flow, whether you're wanting it or not. 
Mm. So you know your baby. I know I know you'll think you need books and you need to look at the internet, but if you just look right deep into your heart, you will be guided by your baby. I'm not saying that you know that there isn't useful information out there, of course there is, and that's what classes are, are, are about. But ultimately, you know your baby best of all. So ditch the advice, and that can be difficult, particularly if advice is coming, say, from your mum, somebody that you, 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 you love and you respect enormously, and you think, well, you know, I survived, so she probably didn't do too bad a job. And then she's coming in with, you know, well, I didn't do that. I, I think you're, you're, you're spoiling your baby if you do that. Or, or you're not picking your baby up again. Or, you're, or she doesn't need feeding again. Does she? She's been feeding a long time. All those sorts of advice that she might not necessarily be criticizing, but it maybe just is coming across as a little disempowering for you. So it is tricky, isn't it, to think, oh, yeah, I am a new mum. I have never done this before. But I am going to be okay because I'm going to listen to myself and to my baby and we're going to work this out together. Mm. So therefore, how important and is that early time, potentially those first few weeks, uh, and Michelle, I'll come to you, where you really protect that space with you, your baby, your partner, if you have one and potentially shut out and and actually maybe this is where covid isn't such a bad thing or lockdown isn't such a bad thing because for some parents they're having that space protected to really focus on getting to know each other michelle what what do you think about that what's your advice to your couples outside yeah, definitely, definitely i mean the first the first bit of advice you know as a dealer i go in and i have no judgment on how they want to do any of it, you know, from being pregnant, labor, birth, parenting, you know, I'm just there to support their choices, you yeah. know. So I think when I go in and explain that, and they will still say, but should I do this or this? And I'll say, well, let's explore that, let's explore that, and then you make a choice. And yeah. they'll say, oh yes, you're not gonna tell us, are you? I said, no, you're there to make the choice, you know. And I think once I've explained that that's what I do, they suddenly realise that actually no one should tell us what to do. They realise that they're to make the choices, you know, because it's their family. And at the end of the day, they're going to be the ones left with the baby. Everyone else will leave their house and they will be the ones looking after the baby. So if they've then chosen to do what granny said, you know, and they're like, well, it's not working, but she said to do it, you know, actually it wasn't maybe the right advice. Um, but I think... Um, where was I going? Um, so, yes, yeah, so I think... Well, I think that's actually an interesting point in itself, that often you get that influx of visitors who want to come round in that first couple of weeks, which possibly is a better time for you to say no to visitors or certainly to restrict, like, we're going to have visitors at certain times of the day or whatever, um, because that can be the time that you can focus on your babies, certainly around feeding, understanding what their feeding cues are so that you can feed them when they're hungry rather than when they're screaming at you. And then it becomes stressful for you. And as we know, Kate, you've been talking about oxytocin. As soon as our adrenaline and cortisol go up, our oxytocin levels go down. So that's not conducive to easy breastfeeding um so you know stressed mum stressed baby the feeding situation becomes stressed um and and maybe some of that pressure like alleviating some of that pressure from the social and having having to get up dressed maybe put some makeup on brush your hair just so that you can have a visitor in your house that potentially feel makes you feel less um calm than if you protect your space and you and your partner really really get to know your baby your baby's needs and and get the technical aspect of feeding really sorted so that if you are wanting to breastfeed you've got that like you know you've got that strong foundation and you know you're you're not worrying about feeding in front of people and getting the latch wrong but not being able to do anything about it because you're trying to hold a conversation with your mum or granny or whoever a mate 
you know. That's one of the major advantages that um, that new mums and uh, partners have uh, said to me through COVID is that they haven't had that pressure of um, visitors or the you know, endless stream of people, you know, wanting to come in and see the new baby. New babies are hugely attractive, aren't they? And everybody wants to see them. And like you say, they literally come in, hold, maybe cuddle the baby, and then and then they're off again. In mm. fact, I went to see a couple, and they said that uh, when, before they'd had the baby, uh, they, they themselves as a young couple. Um, had had very little to do with babies and they went to see friends that had 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 a new baby and they came away from the visit saying how rude the new parents had been they hadn't even offered them a cup of tea and they didn't actually look that great did they they hadn't made any sort of effort and now on the on the other foot they now new parents and they completely get why, why it was that they looked like that so uh, it is and the really expectation that when you visit someone with a new baby you're the one who takes the tea <laughs> in in cups that you then take home with you and wash up <laughs> yeah absolutely but yeah. it is so important not to have you know those sort of distractions because like Iona said to get to know your baby and your own baby's feeding patterns because they will settle into a pattern but they need to find their way with it as well mm -hmm. so without those distractions it's wonderful that new mums and, and their partners can get to know you know what that is when whether it's you know baby tends to sleep a little bit more in the morning but then is a little bit more feedy in the afternoon so without having those distractions and trying to hold off a feed because you've got this visitor to come in and actually I'm not feeling particularly comfortable or confident about feeding the baby or actually it's not going to be great with me up in the bedroom because they've come to see the baby and they're downstairs say in the sitting room so it, I have to say it, but uh, the feedback that I'm getting from new parents is that COVID, yes, it's had some massive, you know, um, challenges. But one of the major advantages that that you can bed down just the either two of you or the three of you, or however, you know, if you've got other children, however many makes your family up. So maybe going forward, what we'll start to see is people taking the baby moon. I think, Element. I think that's where dads no, come seriously. in, that they, they can, you know, shield the visitors, uh, just, you know, say, you know, for the first couple of weeks, actually, we're not really having visitors and absolutely, like I said before, surrounding yourself with those useful people, yeah. so that if you are limiting visitors. Um, that the ones that are coming through the door are going to be those ones, like Iona said, those ones that, you know, we'll get on and put a wash on, um, go out and get you some food in, bring around some, something to eat for the evening meal, mm -hmm. whatever it is that will benefit your family and yourself and your well-being to get you well established and in a good place uh, to be a, you know, to be a, a mum that's feeling, you know, good in their, their own self. And maybe having some of those conversations as well in pregnancy or um, certainly in that early postnatal period with those key people in your lives and to say, you know, this is what we're trying to do so that they can understand it too. And they don't feel that, you know, this is the it's, not, it's not about them. Yeah. 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 Totally. <laughs> yeah. Um, one um, thing that I am hearing, because obviously we talk a lot about the opinions and, and judgments of other people or family members, but one thing I do hear um, from our couples is about some of the unhelpful opinions from medical staff as well. And certainly um, you hear of sort of flippant comments being made. Um, I don't know, I had somebody who was saying that their baby had tongue tie and they were told that it, it, they would find it very difficult to breastfeed and this was they just had a baby there on the postnatal ward and they're being told by a medical professional they're going to find it very difficult when actually they didn't the baby could feed through the tongue tie because most tongue ties you can feed with and don't need that um, it dealing with um, but also we're having parents having conflicting advice from different professionals how Kay, as a medical professional and as a lactation consultant how what is your advice on this because I think it leaves 
new mums especially, feeling very confused, feeling guilty that they're doing things wrong or feeling like they're failing because one person's telling them to do this, the other person's telling them to do that, and they're just not sure where they're standing. What, yeah. How do people work their way through this? It's so hard, isn't it? Particularly when it is a medical professional mm -hmm. thing, an opinion, um, because that will obviously carry a huge amount of weight. Uh, that new mums will take that to heart that that is factual and that, that really saddens me to hear what you said Iona about those comments particularly around tongue tie because mm. you're feeling that you're starting on a, a bit of a negative straight away that you're anticipating a problem that might ne never ever exist it is all around with you know people having wanting to give their opinion even GPs you know when you go to a GP they will, they will still, if a mum goes to a, a, an appointment with a GP and maybe having some issues with breastfeeding and the GP will quite happily volunteer very personal information about their own breastfeeding journey. I found it really difficult. You know what, I, I, I bottle fed or I formula fed and, um, and you know, my, my, my child, and to be honest, I was much happier. You know, those sorts of really unhelpful comments rather than signposting to support, uh, uh, support the support that's necessary. Mm. So it is all about you, know, you having confidence um, around yourself, your ability and your baby. Um, and it is very hard. I'm not saying it's easy to shrug off those comments, but they need, you need to explore, actually, is that, is that an accurate statement that that person has made? Even if they are a doctor or a neonatologist, um, we know that training is very, very poor around breastfeeding, even amongst health professionals and sadly, even amongst midwives. Mm -hmm. um, I did my lactation consultant training when I'd been a midwife for um, nearly 20 years and um, I couldn't believe how much I learned doing my training. Yeah. Um, there are huge gaps in our knowledge and I think we do as even as health professionals we draw on our own personal experience around breastfeeding it is a very emotive subject of course um, so we like to volunteer our own personal uh, experiences um, which mostly are very unhelpful so, so we need to take the personal out of it and come back to absolutely. are we are we coming back to the evidence or evidence accurate information is what you need for your foundations for your breastfeeding journey so and can you baby's behavior sorry yeah so can you maybe tell us um what some of those uh where would you go or where would you signpost people for uh to so sorry it, for it, that it, good information it, brilliant websites um, and you might have already been signposted to them before but there's Kelly Mom, a bit of a naff name but a brilliant brilliant website because there's a huge amount of information on all things breastfeeding you know getting getting you know, antenatal information and then the new baby and then all the way up through extended breastfeeding um, but they're evidenced articles so there are some some articles that say highlight a little bit of uh, like a sentence and then you click on that that will then divert you away from Kelly Mom. So you do need to be a little bit discerning with that in with what you're reading then but whatever article you're reading you de do need to see where has that information come from where is that knowledge being underpinned where where is that evidence supporting that information that's been given the UK equivalent to Kelly Mom is the Breastfeeding Network. It's still hugely, hugely useful. Um, it, it, it is brilliant for medication and breastfeeding. So if you're on any tablets, you're given any medication and you're wondering, is it OK and safe for me to breastfeed? Um, it, it's got a, a, a very good resource on that. Um, again, with your... Um, your support groups remembering that it is there's a lot of opinions in there isn't there when you're when you're joining a support group and um, what i found i did what i what i would do is um remembering to take that almost with a little bit of a pinch of salt there's um a very good facebook group um the bristol breastfeeding mummies um that's a brilliant support um group uh, but it is again mum's own opinions 
um, but they've got a very good admin group and they've got a couple of lactation consultants part of that group so if there is any you know dodgy information on there generally the admin will come in and sort of put things right mm. yeah because I, I I'm a part of that group and you do sometimes see um, I don't know I've seen things like someone will post a photo of their baby with a rash and say does anyone know what this is yeah don't use it for that kind of thing you know right. yeah. <laughs> like that's that go and see your gp or a medical professional yeah yeah, yeah. Um, but i think <coughs> it is an incredibly good group you see how supportive the women are um yeah. it, it's using it as that peer support yeah and then, uh, and that's that's lactation stuff going and seeing a, a lactation consultant i think isn't it and that peer support isn't to be underestimated mm -hmm. That is what the evidence tells us that you mums, it's really important if you can to surround yourself with other breastfeeding mums. That's what will um, make your journey with your breastfeeding a more enjoyable journey. I know it's a really, really obvious thing to say, probably think, yeah, well, of course, Kate, but it's easy, particularly during this time that, you know, you, you have your own friendship group, don't you? And you're, you know, you've got your best friend and you've done this and that together. But actually, she's very unlikely to be pregnant. I mean, great if she is, but she's unlikely to be pregnant and having a baby and breastfeeding at exactly the same time as you. So it is, it does feel a bit, you know, you're going out of your comfort zone, isn't it, to reach out to these people that, you know, you, you don't really know at all. But that is where your um, support group network is so, so important. If you can make those friends around yourself with other people, they don't need to be your best friends, but just literally to have that support network in place for you will be hugely helpful. And um, both Kate and Michelle, do you know what's happening? Because obviously usually you would have um, peer support groups meeting up in cafes and, and so on, um, supporting with feeding. What's happening with to these sorts of um, groups now? Um, and are there any alternatives? I don't know if they're, they're meeting in parks in small groups or... Um, yes, they are meeting, they are still, um, certainly Bristol breastfeeding mummies, they will post out uh, in normal times um, mm -hmm. on a Monday all your local Bristol, South Gloucestershire, North Somerset groups, uh, breastfeeding groups that are meeting up. Mm -hmm. But what they're doing, obviously, due to social distancing and the vulnerability around sort of you, you and your mums is that they are doing them virtually and they are still doing them virtually as local groups. So okay. even if you're not part of an antenatal group, it is still worth joining in on them. So they're, they're using Zoom um, and I think they're very, very well attended. Okay, great. And is that the same in Bath, Michelle? Yeah, yeah, it's exactly the same in Bath. I know the Le Chez League um, group meet up um, on Zoom every week um, as they would do in someone else's house. I think they have done a distance picnic as well mm -hmm. um, when, when it wasn't raining. Um, and uh, yeah, so there is, they are still holding their weekly meets just online now. But I think that's, like you said, they're really well attended um, and really valuable. You know, they're still really, it's just for that connection of people that just get it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And what about for the introverted mum who those groups are difficult, you know, maybe going on to a group and chatting to a group of strangers is hard. But how I think just because you're in a group of people doesn't mean that you're not lonely. You might you might not be making those connections. So how how do people make those connections or how, how do they still find their tribe, if you like, for um, if they find it difficult to approach people? Um, well, I think I think this is where actually Zoom, um, or, or, you know, other platforms have are, are quite good because you're you're in your safety zone of your home mm -hmm. when you feel safe, um, and also you can mute yourself, you can go off screen, you can dip in and out as you feel comfortable, and and some people in groups will never talk you know, and then until maybe three weeks down the line, um, you know, and that's just because they're getting to feel comfortable, um, getting to know other people, working out if it's the right place for them. And then, you know, in time, they then might ask a little question. 
um, or join in the conversations. Um, and I find that's, you know, that kind of happens in real life as well. People pluck up the courage to attend a group um, and they maybe just sit and listen. And generally that's okay. People accept that because they've been there. You know, there'll be people that have been going there for, for years and they know what that first time is like and they know, you know, how it feels. So I think, you know, there's no, generally, I don't think there's much, there's pressure to be involved. You'll always have people that will be the talkers. Yeah, you know, in any social situation, you've always got that, um, whether you're pregnant or, you know, wherever you are, um, you'll always have the talkers, the bigger characters that are there to, you know, sort of um, guide the group almost really. Um, and then, you know, you've got the sort of almost hierarchy almost, but in, in support groups, it's more sort of those, high, those sort of um, louder, more confident figures understand, almost understand their role more and they understand that they yeah. are. If you are that louder, more confident person, recognising who the quiet people are in the group and picking them out to have a bit of a chat with afterwards. So, yeah, yeah so understanding group dynamics and... Yeah. yeah. But, but I always say to the the mums that it, it is it does feel, isn't it, that leap of faith, isn't it, going to a, a breastfeeding group? But it, it is your your ultimate fan club, really, isn't it? You know, you've got you've got that perfect space to just be open and and to feel you you can you definitely can breastfeed your baby here. But it is for the the person who um is you know feeling a little bit you know uncomfortable maybe about joining in a big group and certainly in normal times pre-COVID the um some of the uh, breastfeeding groups uh the local breastfeeding groups would be really quite big and they can feel hugely intimidating then to trying to join in but I always say to my mums when I see them you know I spy another mum who's got a baby about your size and just say hello because they will be dying to speak as that's well. actually a really good tip looking for a baby of a similar size i like that yeah <laughs> yeah no that's great um or somebody who looks equally uncomfortable <laughs> yeah, yeah. very often how somebody is appearing mm. even the most confident like you were saying michelle even the most the person who's used to being you know that that sort of life and soul of a party when they become a new mum you don't know what's happening inside to them do you they can be feeling absolutely oh I'm across it on the outside is something very different so yeah. it, it isn't maybe always the, the appearance can be something very different to what's happening inside mm, yeah. mm. cool um so i'm just having a look and thinking yeah so actually maybe you can tell us a little bit about the support that is available um kate both through the nhs for breastfeeding mums um, but also the private services that they can access. Um, so, yeah, so for breastfeeding support, uh, as I say, you've got all... Bristol is a brilliant city to be breastfeeding in, first off. Mm -hmm. um, we were the first baby-friendly city, so um, we have got a huge amount of support out there for your, you mums, completely free of charge. Um, so, uh, like I say, you've got your local breastfeeding group. So, if you um, just access the uh, Bristol Local Authority uh, website, it'll tell you all about the breast breastfeeding groups that will be um, running close to you, local to you, which is really important, isn't it? Because ideally, what you're wanting is you're wanting support close to you. So, for mums who maybe had cesareans or who don't who don't drive, to be able to form a network that's close to you that you know that a mum can just you know pop down the road to see you or you can meet in a local park or whatever that that's really you know your, your best option mm. um, in the hospital so uh, both at St Michael's and at Southmead you've got um, infant feeding specialists midwives uh, so um, you can ask either your midwife or health visitor GP or you can self-refer to see any of those um, as part of um, the National Health Service. So that's absolutely perfect. Um, do the health visitors in um, Bristol and Bath actually, um, do they 
run feeding workshops. I know we we work with somebody who works in another trust and they run feeding support groups for their parents. Obviously in lockdown, it's a little different, but um, are those available in Bristol as well? I'm not a, I, I don't think formally. I think it's it would be very local. Um, yeah. so some uh, health institutes will run uh, sort of, um, what do you call them? Not quite baby courses, but you know, to various topics for new mums. Yeah. Um, so part of sometimes of the weighing clinic, um, which obviously we're not having at the moment, that, that can then lead on to like a breastfeeding group afterwards. But I think it's very much um, sort of local um, uh, related rather than, you know, completely. And as well, with some midwives, some um, uh, teams of midwives will run um, breastfeeding groups. But mostly they're peer support or breastfeeding counsellors that will run them. Um, um, uh yeah okay great um so i am having some questions starting to come through um and guys if you do have any questions about anything feeding related pop them in here um or anything really um one of these is uh looking for some practical advice when people are allowed out and about a bit more what types of clothing are best to wear to easily breastfeed i guess without flashing your boobs um, <laughs> and um, ideally not wanting to spend lots of money on expensive clothing um, yeah I think that's a big thing isn't it like that that can lead to mum staying in the house because it is a big thing to suddenly be getting your boobs out in public if you're not used to doing it <laughs> it doesn't count on a Friday night <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> isn't it it's that whole thing i get that over and over when i see a mum and they say you know yeah so how am i ever going to do this outside mm -hmm. when i out in public but i always do the demo i don't know if you can see me but okay so i always i don't go far without my woody boots you, you might need to pop your um camera down just if you can move your camera or oh, stand up yeah there you go perfect how much do you see of your boob yeah, so that's with me not having anything there. So unless you're me, most, most people divert their eyes when they see a baby breastfeed, okay? <laughs> so there's not, there's not many people that will, you know, want to, oh, what, what's she doing, you know? So I think it is all about our, con our sort of misconception, isn't it, around breastfeeding? And, I, and that is not me sort of underplaying the fact that, gosh, this does feel like a really big thing going out to breastfeed in public. Of mm -hmm. course it will. I remember it exactly the same. But I think just be reassured that, number one, even if you are breastfeeding in public and you haven't got the perfect clothes that, you know, do cover you completely, that you really will be, that um, everybody else will really be seeing very little of your breast. Um, I, I have to say personally I don't like the whole sort of cover um, over the baby and you know so that you know you are just completely sort of shielded um, it just feels very very unnatural it, you know you don't sort of you can't sort of see very well what's going on and it all feels all you know I'm probably it's my age but it all feels a bit hot really um, and I think I would be very hot and bothered trying to do that but it is having that sort of loose fitting layered clothes um, that is is perfect really for breastfeeding and um, all I'd say is that if, if you've got friends who have breastfed it, it's a really good way to borrow um, their clothes and um, because there's such a huge amount available now in stores um, and you don't have to go to the very expensive stores to um, to buy you know the, the, the perfect breastfeeding top H&M um, uh, where else was I thinking? Uh, where else does the um, breastfeeding clothes, maternity clothes? We haven't got mother care anymore. Mm -hmm. Mamas and papas. Yeah, mamas and papas. Mamas and papas. Uh, I mean, you have obviously got your high end, but the, the sort of your high street stores still will. Topshop, that's the one I was thinking of, or New Look. They, they do um, maternity wear and breastfeeding tops. That you have really quite a lot of like vest tops don't you that have almost like a top layer a yeah. double layer thing going on so you can yeah yeah, yeah. like a little sort of under yeah. Top, yeah. The top and then yeah. Um, yeah so you can be discreet definitely and also if you're going out with your partner or whoever 
they can almost screen you until you've yeah. got your baby on they can sort of stand up and sort of stand over you i mean not quite oh she's feeding but you know you can be again discreet about it um or more subtle about it rather and then once the baby's on and sucking and you're feeling happy then they can just move to the side and then again when the baby comes off uh, they stand up again mm. yeah and um i guess there are those times when babies get a little older when if they're out and about they want to stare at everything else going on in the room so those are the times that you're probably more likely to be flashing and by that stage you probably won't by that stage you, you less you care less that's true. <laughs> you'll, you'll know where you're going that yeah. you're going to be surrounded by other mums in exactly the same situation yeah. and as i say bristol is an amazing city that we have so we're so so fortunate so many places that we can go to to feed our babies without feeling uncomfortable yeah yeah no absolutely um we did also have a question about when a good time to start expressing is and um, a little bit more information about expressing alongside breastfeeding I yeah, guess, so to manage that yeah so it's a, it's a really really good question and um really you can so around expressing, it's, has anybody seen one of these fellas, the uh, silicon pump? Um, so it's advertised as a pump, but there is no pump involved, but they're, they're a really nifty way to collect your letdown milk whilst you're breastfeeding your baby without having to factor in at any time to express. So for the mums, I think there's some mums amongst us that haven't had their babies yet, um, but you can start to use this really as soon as your milk has come in and um, because it does alleviate a lot of the engorgement um, and then you've you know got a nice little bit in the in the silicon pump that you can pop in the freezer for a later date um so that, that where is where really, would they find that where, so would they find, where would they find that pump these are only available through um amazon or ebay they're not in store at the moment but they are cheap i mean there's not much to them you can see they are just like silicon and literally all you do is you just pop it so you make sure that the nipple is centralized in there and yeah. then just squeeze the bottom and then that just suctions it in place so it will just stick there i mean obviously a baby moves its legs or whatever because obviously you're using it on the other boob as you're breastfeeding and as the baby's initiating those letdowns those surges of milk as they're feeding that will then just drip the other boob into here i have a lot of mums say but i don't ever seem to drip on the other breast it absolutely doesn't matter this still is very effective particularly when the boobs are quite full which generally is in the morning yeah yeah great if you were wanting to express using a pump i wouldn't start until you have established with your feeding so that's usually around about sort of four weeks into your breastfeeding journey um and usually the best time to express when you will yield the most is usually around about uh sometime in the morning that's usually when the boobs are sort of at their fullest your boobs are never ever empty but the fat content is variable and it usually increases as the day progresses so the volume will decrease it's still perfect for your baby but it's just there won't be a load of milk that you would have say in the morning if you were going to ask um, or you want dad to do a bottle, it's really important that that's avoided between the hours of 1 a.m. and 5 a.m. because that's the time when your prolactin, your wonderful milk producing hormone peaks. So which is why in the early days, your baby or early weeks, your babies tend to be a bit more nocturnal. So they tend to be more settled during the day. I don't know if you've found that already. <laughs> a few nods there, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then as the sun goes down, they start to really liven up and they'll feed a lot. They're doing that for a reason. It's super, super clever. They know that they need to stimulate their mum's supply, which is why they do that feeding pattern, which is why it isn't a good idea to then offer a bottle through the night. It will have a really big impact on your supply. Such a tricky one, isn't it? Because often that's the time mums want a bottle to be oh, introduced. Yeah, completely. Yeah. Yeah. which i think is why i i always love the idea of dads coming in or partners coming in at as you said earlier that 5 a.m feed yeah. 
they, they sort of take a mark and just sleep until eight or something. And yes, absolutely. And actually, um, I was reading some research about sleep. We're, we're looking into some sleep products at the moment. And um, there was a piece of research I read that for new mums, apparently, um, if you have two 30 minute naps in a daytime, your bodies are designed for those two naps, just 30 minutes to completely re-energize you so that even if you are dealing with that lack of sleep, you know, two, three hours of broken sleep through the night, those two naps can bring you back so that you can function at a, a normal level, which is incredible. I think our, our bodies as women are incredible. You know, they are designed to have babies and to cope with babies. Um, but a lot of it is about responding to those, the baby's needs and, and, actually recognizing your own body needs so sleeping when your baby sleeps rather than doing the housework i know it's a, a common one that we always say but really focusing get those two 30 minute naps when your baby's napping um and it will help you through those night feeds and then if partners can take the early morning feed you know that's, that's really interesting you've read that study because there's studies that have always supported that that um because of uh, you you mums we don't have it i'm not breastfeeding but you mums who are breastfeeding you have those high levels of oxytocin which facilitate high quality sleep yeah um, yeah I mean, it's not long but it's good quite like, good exactly quality. like it's double or sometimes triple in compared to what you know, say you had you've just had an hour sleep that's equivalent to sort of my maybe two hour or three hour sleep mm -hmm. in sort of resetting and recharging you mm -hmm. i mean it's incredible i mean nature is so incredibly clever yeah absolutely right i do have another um question coming on here what do you do when a baby is hungry but rejecting the breast because like wailing pushing away which you know happens doesn't it so it what does you... it does and then it's difficult isn't it to get out of the stress cycle oh my baby my baby doesn't want me so i'd always suggest uh, so if you if you if a baby is really sort of you know completely screaming you're trying to latch the baby just stop just you know pop baby over the shoulder and calm the baby yeah or even give baby to dad but if you do bring the baby up and the baby is calm and then it's calm usually only for a couple of seconds so don't think oh great that's fine lovely and calm now because very quickly the baby will start to cry again so if the baby is then calm then quickly reset and start again with the latch Mm. also skin to skin is just wonderful that will really it'll calm your baby and calm you it's sort of mutually reinforcing all of that and again once the baby is calm you probably will find the baby will cry even more when you're trying to take the clothes off the baby but once the baby is then naked and it is important to emphasize that that does mean that you need to be bare from the top so there's no bra in place for you so it, it's quite easy to sort of forget about your bra but get your bra off so that you're completely bare mm -hmm. and place your baby in that sort of frog-like position so that you've got your baby as much skin contact as possible usually the baby be like that mm -hmm. so that there's no fear of the baby getting cold then um, and then that will calm you and then again there's no problem with feeding skin to skin it's wonderful and I think it's something that as the baby gets older we sort of forget about almost isn't it that once the baby gets bigger if the baby's upset because the baby is that much bigger you've almost forgotten about the skin to skin that worked beautifully when the baby was a newborn yeah yeah I saw a lovely photo actually on Instagram earlier of a mum feeding twins all of them naked um and it, you know, oh, it was beautiful really beautiful photo um yeah okay wonderful thank you so uh another question here if we express in the morning should we do it immediately after a feed or a bit later and which boob if he finishes on one boob would expressing on that same boob work or should we use the other one a few questions in there <laughs> So the advice is that um, if you're going to express, so if you breastfed on the one side and the baby hasn't wanted the other side, then that's absolutely perfect for you to express. 
most babies will take both boobs and the advice is that really you should offer both boobs it doesn't matter if they don't take the second breast but it's really important that they are offered the second mm -hmm. boob so in the case that the baby has taken both boobs then i would wait around an hour after the feed unless it's been a much shorter feed on the second breast but you could as i say if you use your silicon pump you could use that at each feed during the 24 hours even taking it up to bed with you some of them come now with lids but even if they didn't come with a lid you could just be canted into a clean bottle with a lid and it can stay outside at the side of your bed or on your bedside table for six hours at room temperature without you needing them to uh, run down to the fridge in the middle of the night so you could just keep dripping your milk using this and decanting it into a clean bottle and then obviously you'd need to then clean this out uh, you don't need to sterilize it and um, if it's breast milk contaminated you don't need to sterilize it but you do need to be scrupulous with your hygiene so cleaning it out hot soapy water and then clean and then a rinse out with hot water does okay. that does that make sense yeah that does make sense yeah yeah um we have let's have a look um on the back of night on the back of feeding at night when a baby starts sleeping for longer overnight which is always a yeah time for parents to be cheering um is it prudent to wake the baby to maintain the milk supply or has your ma your milk supply adapted by that stage so absolutely, if the baby is sleeping longer at night, you absolutely do not need to wake in the baby. The only issue happens if, say, the last feed has been, say, a, a formula feed, um, and then the baby then has a longer sleep. So say dad gives baby a, a formula feed at around 11 o'clock, maybe at night, mum's gone to bed early, and then the baby, for whatever reason, doesn't waken until after five. That's been an artificial sleep because the, the formula is a slower milk to digest and empty out of their bellies. But if it's been a breast feed that's been the last feed and then the baby sleeps that long, that is absolutely no problem. But with it being a formula feed, then you'll have missed that opportunity when your prolactin is peaking between 1 a.m. and 5 a.m. And that can impact on your supply. So if it's happening naturally, and it does usually happen for the first part of the night, like I said, these babies are very, very clever. So usually they'll cluster feed from about two weeks until they're about eight weeks. They'll cluster feed in the evening. They'll feed, you know, for a couple of hours on end in the evening, and then they'll have their longest stretch of sleep over 24 hours. That's usually when you'll get that longest interval. And that's when you get yourself to bed and try and get that sleep. But they'll usually then waken somewhere between sort of two, three, four o'clock in the night um, to boost your prolactin. But if it doesn't, if it does happen that you've gone outside those hours and it's happened naturally, sleep. Don't wake in your baby. Enjoy your rest. Definitely. Um, what about to prevent engorgement or discomfort? Is it worth expressing for those reasons overnight if, if mum is uncomfortable and baby is asleep? It's all about balance. So if, if your baby is you know, feeding in that way and um, it, your supply will literally just balance for your baby. Of course, if it's the first time the baby has slept that long, then your boobs, you know, when you wake and can feel so engorged and it's almost a bit tricky to latch the baby because the nipples almost flatten so much, there's no give in the boob. So you could do some hand expressing. And again, that, you'd probably think I've got shares in this. I really haven't. <laughs> um, that's when you could pop on um, your uh, silicon pump just before the baby feeds. You could literally just suction it on. I, in fact, I saw a mum recently who had bought two of these and she woke in the night about an hour before her baby woke and the baby had gone a little bit longer than normal and she literally just put the, these on, just both boobs, left it on there for five minutes and it naturally just suctioned and expressed mm -hmm. a little bit of milk enough that then when the baby did waken, the boobs were much, much softer. But if you haven't got one of these, you could just gently hand express. I certainly wouldn't recommend you using a pump 
um, to, to express unless you were doing it to Mr. Feed, because then you might just make your, your supply a little bit more imbalanced and maybe end up with a bit of an oversupply. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, any tips for increasing milk supply and is it ever too late to work on this? I think that's a great question. Isn't it? Really good question. Yeah, really good question. Do you want to answer that? No, no. no. Yeah. Increasing milk supply. So yes, there's, there's lots of ways that we can increase milk supply. So it's, it's um, fitting in with your baby's cue. So not scheduling your baby. So just allowing your baby to feed when they want to feed. And that can be so confusing because in our heads, you know, we've got this, or oh, they should be in a routine, you know, they should be feeding every four hours or something. Whereas breastfeeding just isn't about that. Your prolactin, it's a stimulating hormone, which likes to be stimulated. It shouldn't know where it is in life. So it can be, you know, a one hour interval, a two hour interval, a four hour interval, then a one and a half hour interval. So it is just, you know, fitting in with your baby. So not scheduling your baby at all. Doing that lovely skin to skin contact, enjoying those lovely snuggles that will naturally boost your supply as well. Um, there is a, a, a galactagog, a fancy name for a drug that uh, enhances uh, your milk supply. Um, which it's actually an anti-sickness tablet that they fell across completely by accident. So amongst breastfeeding mothers who are taking this tablet, they found that their supply increased. Uh, so there's been lots of studies and trials done on its benefits and any risks, and it's perfectly safe. And um, it's, it's designed, it boosts your prolactin. So you're on it for about two weeks. Um, but that wouldn't really be recommended until the baby was at least two weeks old. So we would want to look at what was happening in the breastfeeding picture before you started on any sort of medication with, around um, boosting your milk supply. So again, you know, making sure your latch is good so that it isn't not quite, it, it, it's very tempting, isn't it, when the, the uh, latch is painful to not allow your baby to sort of finish the feed themselves. So, oh, it looks like he's finished and actually it's been pretty painful. I'm just gonna unlatch my baby. That can really impact on, a, on your supply enormously. So it's allowing the baby to finish the feed themselves, but at the beginning, making sure that that latch is, is good and the transfer of milk is perfect. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, yeah, also just clarification, always recommend both boobs at every feed. Yeah, what's important is that the baby spontaneously unlatches from the boob at the beginning. So the baby will do these sort of little subtle flutter little sucks at the end of a feed and then they'll unlatch. And it's those flutter sucks and the baby unlatching that dictates the end of the first boob. So what I usually recommend to mums is when the baby's showing you those early feeding cues, that's the time to lift and feed the baby, not to do the nappy. Once you sort of, if you do the nappy when the baby's showing you those early cues, by the time you've done the nappy and, oh, it needs a clean vest because, oh, now she's just weed on the mat. And by the time then you've got the baby to the boob, the baby has probably completely lost the plot and will be very distressed and hands everywhere. So if you pick your baby up and feed your baby at those earliest feeding cues, it's better for everybody. Then yeah. allow the baby to do its natural feeding pattern, flutter and fall off the boob, little wind, and then do the nappy. It'll be a calmer nappy change usually as well. And then offer the second breast. As I say, it doesn't matter if they don't want it. My experience is most babies will take the second breast, but it just maximizes that milk transfer for the baby so that they're getting the most that they really want. It consolidates the feed rather than the baby having one boob, looking lovely and settled in the mum over the mum's shoulder. You put them down in the Moses basket to go off for a wee. 10, 20 minutes later, the baby's giving you cues again. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Great. No, thank you. And um, is it ever too late to improve the latch? Another great question. Never, never, ever. No. Never, ever. It is trickier in older babies because obviously they're, you know, habit formed. But with the, the right advice, it is never too late. And it is an absolute myth that the, the latch is painful and that nipples should just toughen up. 
that is an absolute myth yeah. your latch should not be painful it will be a pulling and a strong tug but it shouldn't be painful yeah no absolutely and um is it ever bad to let babies fall asleep on the boob i'd say it's quite difficult to stop them at times isn't it okay babies love to fall asleep on the boob there's studies now that just totally support it's something that sh you know is good for them babies are born with all their neurons um, at birth and what, what, what they need to do is connect those neurons and one of the main hormones that allows that is oxytocin so by cuddling your baby in close allowing them to fall asleep on the boob that's going to flood their brain with that oxytocin and enhance their, their neurons to, um, to connect mm. so I you're not people... your baby right. you're setting your baby up for bad habits mm. you're not teaching your baby that they can't sleep alone or they can't self-soothe whatever that means mm. this is all good it's very very natural but again when you've got people looking over your shoulder and telling you oh you shouldn't be doing that and you're never going to be able to have your baby settle on its own it can be really difficult to feel that you're doing something wrong by doing that but it, it is absolutely something that is is encouraged actively mm. And I think in those early days as well, the baby is um, craving contact because they're so used to having contact. They're used to hearing your heartbeat. You know, they've been inside of you. So for them to be away from you is actually the bit that's harder. And, um, you know, sleep comes later. Um, exactly. Totally. Another <laughs> workshop on sleep. <laughs> And, you know, discount bed sharing laying down with your baby sleeping so alongside kelly mom and the breastfeeding network there's also a fabulous uh, website called um basis infant sleep information and support it's called and it's, sorry sorry say that one again it's called basis oh basis oh i know basis yeah, infant sleep information support so it is all around um sort of sleep and safe sleeping um which is which is crucial feeding laying down safely uh, but again it's mutually reinforcing sleep for mum and milk for the baby so it's yeah. a win-win situation again there's ma masses of misconceptions about it and myths um, mm. but if it feels right for you in your heart as a mum then it's right it's okay to do mm. yeah no great and um just so everyone knows, I have popped all of the websites we've talked about in the chat, um, but I'll pop them in an email to you all later with a recording of today's session. Um, we've also been asked, is any face-to-face -face support available at the moment? This is what we were talking about um, earlier, isn't it, Kate? <laughs> yes. It is. Uh, so privately or, uh, or both? I guess both. So, I guess both. Uh, yeah, so so I, I think the short answer for the NHS is pretty well no. Mm -hmm. um, they in St Michael's, they uh, if so if a baby has say a tongue tie, the uh, ENT department will now divide them. As far as I know, Southmead haven't resumed their tongue tie service. Okay. Uh, infant feeding uh, specialist support is done mostly virtually. Um, as far as I'm aware, I think it's hugely limited face to face. Mm. Um, I have resumed face-to-face uh, -face, uh, home visits. Um, I have my own PPE. I only resumed last week. I'm fully insured. Uh, I check for COVID symptoms before I go. I do as much of my consultation at a two-metre two distance and I have a hands-off approach with the breastfeeding um, latch and technique. Uh, so uh, it is done as safely as possible. Mm. Um, so yes, that's where, that's where I'm at at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Michelle are you aware of similar things in Bath? Yeah it's basically the same in Bath um, I think the tongue yeah the tongue tie service is still um, not really fully resumed yeah um, and yeah the rest of the support's virtual still yeah, yeah. actually there is uh, just to say that there is um, uh, private uh, like uh, private um, tongue tie practitioners that are doing uh, tongue tie divisions and I know one particularly has carried on through COVID oh wow okay yeah 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 great um, cool 
Um, oh, we've just heard <laughs> Southmead resume tongue tie on Friday. Um, somebody has had that done today. <laughs> so, oh, brilliant. That is good news. That's yeah, that is very good news. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So um, does anybody have any other questions that you'd like to ask at all about anything we've covered today um, before I open up breakout rooms for anyone who wants to hang out and maybe chat amongst yourselves as well? Um, yeah, if you do, you can unmute yourselves. If you don't, we will say goodbye and uh, open up breakout rooms. Cool, I think it looks like everybody, there's no more questions. So um, I will finish by saying a huge thank you to both Kate and Michelle for taking the time to be with us today. Um, it's been another really, really interesting discussion and some really useful tips for everybody. So yeah, massive thank you um, to both of you. Um, for those of you who are on the workshop yesterday I will do the same um, as I said I will go through all of the content that we've um, run through today in the next few weeks and I will put together some sort of resource um, that condenses some of those tips um, into something for you and I'll, I'll email that out to everybody on the call um, later today I will email you with a copy of this recording um, so that you can watch it again at your leisure or share it with family and friends you might think will find it useful um but yeah um thank you guys hugely it was brilliant yeah thank you, thank you. your services for um either a zoom support with breastfeeding um i'm i haven't had my baby yet but due any any day now um how do we just liaise with you um how do we go about booking or, or yeah so um it, so my website's called the perfect start I think that's um, more actually from a friend of mine who, who's yeah. been with you. Okay, so usually, I mean, there's, there's, I, there's no need to book me in, um, you know, now, because obviously yeah. you don't know when you're going to have your baby. Yeah. Yeah. Most of my uh, appointments, it's usually a mum will get in touch with me and then I'll get out to see them the next day. Uh, so it's usually quick and mostly mums, like they want the support like now almost. <laughs> uh, so unless I, I work two days a week in the hospital, so unless, and I don't generally do two days together. So it's only unless it, I've got a shift the next day that I, then it would be the day after. Um, so um, yeah, just, just give me either a call, a text, a WhatsApp, uh, or an email either is fine and uh, and then we can just uh, sort that out once you've had your baby if you did want me to do I just to say although I'm doing home visits I'm absolutely still uh, offering virtual uh, sessions as well perfect perfect lovely okay and I, I will also send out um, the web addresses for these guys so that you've got them um, along with everything else brilliant um, thanks so much ladies amazing ah oh, good, really good. Great, well...